63. In a second experiment, Dr. Robotham affixed flags five feet high along the shoreline, one at every mile marker, then using his telescope mounted at five feet just behind the first flag, looked over the tops of all six flags, which lined up in a perfectly straight line. If the Earth were a ball 25,000 miles in circumference, the flags should have progressively dipped down after the first establishing line of sight, the second would have descended eight inches, 32 inches for the third, six feet for the fourth, 10 feet 8 inches for the 5th, and 16 feet 8 inches for the 6th. 64. Quoting Earth Not a Globe by Samuel Robotham, It is known that the horizon at sea, whatever distance it may extend to the right and left of the observer on land, always appears as a straight line. The following experiment has been tried in various parts of the country. At Brighton, on a rising ground near the race course, two poles were affixed in the earth six yards apart and directly opposite the sea. Between these poles, a line was tightly stretched parallel to the horizon. From the center of the line, the view embraced not less than 20 miles on each side, making a distance of 40 miles. A vessel was observed sailing directly westwards. The line cut the rigging a little above the bulwarks, which it did for several hours or until the vessel had sailed the whole distance of 40 miles. The ship coming into view from the east would have to ascend an inclined plane for 20 miles until it arrived at the center of the arc, whence it would have to descend for the same distance. The square of 20 miles multiplied by 8 inches gives 266 feet as the amount the vessel would be below the line at the beginning and at the end of the 40 miles. 65. Also quoting Dr. Robotham. On a shore near Waterloo, a few miles to the north of Liverpool, a good telescope was fixed at an elevation of six feet above the water. It was directed to a large steamer, just leaving the River Mercy and sailing out to Dublin. Gradually, the masthead of the receding vessel came nearer to the horizon, until, at length, after more than four hours had elapsed, it disappeared. The ordinary rate of sailing of the Dublin steamers was fully eight miles an hour, so that the vessel would be at least thirty-two miles distant when the masthead came to the horizon. The six feet of elevation of the telescope would require three miles to be deducted for convexity, which would leave 29 miles, the square of which multiplied by 8 inches gives 560 feet, deducting 80 feet for the height of the main mast, and we find that, according to the doctrine of rotundity, the masthead of the outward bound steamer should have been 480 feet below the horizon. Many other experiments of this kind have been made upon sea-going steamers, and always with results entirely incompatible with the theory that the Earth is a globe. 66. Dr. Robotham conducted several other experiments using telescopes, spirit levels, sextants, and theodolites, special precision instruments used for measuring angles in horizontal or vertical planes. By positioning them at equal heights, aimed at each other successively, he proved over and over the earth to be perfectly flat for miles without a single inch of curvature. His findings caused quite a stir in the scientific community, and thanks to thirty years of his efforts, the shape of the earth became a hot topic of debate around the turn of the nineteenth century. 67. The distance across the Irish Sea from the Isle of Man's Douglas Harbour to Great Orm's Head in North Wales is sixty miles. If the earth was a globe, then the surface of the water between them would form a 60-mile arc, the center towering 1,944 feet higher than the coastlines at either end. It is well known and easily verifiable, however, that on a clear day from a modest altitude of 100 feet, the Great Orm's Head is visible from Douglas Harbor. This would be completely impossible on a globe of 25,000 miles. Assuming the 100-foot altitude causes the horizon to appear approximately 13 miles off, 47 miles remaining means the Welsh coastline should still fall an impossible 1,472 feet below the line of sight. 68. The Philadelphia skyline is clearly visible from Apple Pie Hill in the New Jersey Pine Barrens 40 miles away. If Earth were a ball 25,000 miles in circumference, factoring in the 205-foot elevation of Apple Pie Hill, the Philly skyline should remain well hidden beyond 335 feet of curvature. 69. The New York City skyline is clearly visible from Harriman State Park's Bear Mountain 60 miles away. If Earth were a ball 25,000 miles in circumference, viewing from Bear Mountain's 1,283-foot summit, the Pythagorean theorem determining distance to the horizon being 1.23 times the square root of the height in feet, the New York City skyline should be invisible behind 170 feet of curved Earth. 70. 
From Washington's Rock in New Jersey, at just a 400-foot elevation, it is possible on a clear day to see the skylines of both New York and Philadelphia in opposite directions at the same time, covering a total distance of 120 miles. If Earth were a ball 25,000 miles in circumference, both of these skylines should be hidden behind over 800 feet of Earth's curvature. And near State Park, this is from Joshua Nowicki, and what you're seeing here is a mirage. We typically would not be able to see this from the Lake Michigan shore. We talked about this last night. Conditions are right on the lake that we're actually seeing a mirage of the Chicago skyline. 71. It is often possible to see the Chicago skyline from sea level 60 miles away across Lake Michigan. In 2015, after photographer Joshua Nowicki photographed this phenomenon, several news channels quickly claimed his picture to be a superior mirage, an atmospheric anomaly caused by temperature inversion. While these certainly do occur, the skyline in question was facing right side up and clearly seen, unlike a hazy, illusory mirage, and on a ball earth 25,000 miles in circumference, should be 2,400 feet below the horizon. 72. October 16, 1854, the Times newspaper reported the Queen's visit to Great Grimsby from Hull, recording they were able to see the 300-foot-tall dock tower from 70 miles away. On a ball earth 25,000 miles in circumference, factoring their 10-foot elevation above the water and the tower's 300-foot height at 70 miles away, the dock tower should have remained an entire 2,600 feet below the horizon. 73. In 1872, Captain Gibson and crewmates, sailing the ship Thomas Wood from China to London, reported seeing the entirety of St. Helena Island on a clear day from 75 miles away. Factoring in their height during measurement on a ball earth 25,000 miles in circumference, it was found the island should have been 3,650 feet below their line of sight. 74. From Genoa, Italy, at a height of just 70 feet above sea level, the island of Gorgona can often be seen 81 miles away. If Earth were a ball 25,000 miles in circumference, Gorgona should be hidden beyond 3,332 feet of curvature. 75. From Genoa, Italy, at a height of just 70 feet above sea level, the island of Corsica can often be seen 99 miles away. If Earth were a ball 25,000 miles in circumference, Corsica should fall 5,245 feet, almost an entire mile below the horizon. 76. From Genoa, Italy, 70 feet above sea level, the island of Caprea, 102 miles away, can often be seen as well. If Earth were a ball 25,000 miles in circumference, Caprea should always remain hidden behind 5,605 feet over a mile of supposed curvature. 77. Also from Genoa, on bright, clear days, the island of Elba can be seen an incredible 125 miles away. If Earth were a ball 25,000 miles in circumference, Elba should be forever invisible behind 8,770 feet of curvature. 78. From Anchorage, Alaska, at an elevation of 102 feet, on clear days, Mount Foraker can be seen with the naked eye 120 miles away. If Earth were a ball 25,000 miles in circumference, Mount Foraker's 17,400-foot summit should be leaning back away from the observer, covered by 7,719 feet of curved Earth. In reality, however, the entire mountain can be quite easily seen standing straight from base to summit. 79. From Anchorage, Alaska, at an elevation of 102 feet, on clear days, Mount McKinley can be seen with the naked eye from 130 miles away. If Earth were a ball 25,000 miles in circumference, Mount McKinley's 20,320-foot summit should be leaning back away from the observer and almost half covered by 9,220 feet of curved Earth. In reality, however, the entire mountain can be quite easily seen standing straight from base to summit. 80. In Chambers' journal, February 1895, a sailor near Mauritius in the Indian Ocean reported having seen a vessel which turned out to be an incredible 200 miles away. The incident caused much heated debate in nautical circles at the time, gaining further confirmation in Aden, Yemen, where another witness reported seeing a missing Bombay steamer from 200 miles away. 
He correctly stated the precise appearance, location, and direction of the steamer, all later corroborated and confirmed correct by those on board. Such sightings are absolutely inexplicable if the Earth were actually a ball 25,000 miles around, as ships 200 miles distant would have to fall approximately 5 miles below line of sight. 81. The distance from which various lighthouse lights around the world are visible at sea far exceeds what could be found on a ball earth 25,000 miles in circumference. For example, the Dunkirk light in southern France, at an altitude of 194 feet, is visible from a boat 10 feet above sea level, 28 miles away. Spherical trigonometry dictates that if the earth was a globe with the given curvature of 8 inches per mile squared, this light should be hidden 190 feet below the horizon. 82. The Port Nicholson light in New Zealand is 420 feet above sea level and visible from 35 miles away, where it should be 220 feet below the horizon. 83. The Ekerö light in Norway is 154 feet above high water and visible from 28 statute miles, where it should be 230 feet below the horizon. 84. The light at Madras on the Esplanade is 132 feet high and visible from 28 miles away, where it should be 250 feet below the line of sight. 85. The Cordonon light on the west coast of France is 207 feet high and visible from 31 miles away, where it should be 280 feet below the line of sight. 86. The light at Cape Bonavista, Newfoundland, is 150 feet above sea level and visible at 35 miles, where it should be 491 feet below the horizon. 87. The lighthouse steeple of St. Boltoff's Parish Church in Boston is 290 feet tall and visible from over 40 miles away, where it should be hidden a full 800 feet below the horizon. 88. The Isle of Wight Lighthouse in England is 180 feet high and can be seen up to 42 miles away, a distance at which modern astronomers say the light should fall 996 feet below the line of sight. 89. The Cape Lagulas Lighthouse in South Africa is 33 feet high, 238 feet above sea level, and can be seen for over 50 miles. If the world were a globe, this light would fall 1,400 feet below an observer's line of sight. 90. The Statue of Liberty in New York stands 326 feet above sea level, and on a clear day can be seen as far as 60 miles away. If the Earth were a globe, that would put Lady Liberty at an impossible 2,074 feet below the horizon. 91. The lighthouse at Port Said, Egypt, at an elevation of only 60 feet, has been seen an astonishing 58 miles away, where, according to modern astronomy, it should be 2,182 feet below the line of sight. 92. The Notre Dame Antwerp spire stands 403 feet high from the foot of the tower with Strasbourg measuring 468 feet above sea level. With the aid of a telescope, ships can be distinguished on the horizon, and captains declare they can see the cathedral spire from an amazing 150 miles away. If the Earth were a globe, however, at that distance the spire should be an entire mile, 5,280 feet below the horizon. 93. The St. George's Channel between Holyhead and Kingstown Harbor near Dublin is 60 miles across. When halfway across, a ferry passenger will notice behind them the light on Holyhead Pier as well as in front of them the pool bag light in Dublin Bay. The Holyhead Pier light is 44 feet high, while the pool bag lighthouse 68 feet. Therefore, a vessel in the middle of the channel, 30 miles from either side, standing on a deck 24 feet above the water, can clearly see both lights. On a ball earth 25,000 miles in circumference, however, both lights should be hidden well below both horizons by over 300 feet. 94. From the highland near Portsmouth Harbor in Hampshire, England, looking across Spithead to the Isle of Wight, the entire base of the island, where water and land come together, composes a perfectly straight line 22 statute miles long. According to the Ball Earth theory, the Isle of Wight should decline 80 feet from the center on each side to account for the necessary curvature. The crosshairs of a good theodolite directed there, however, have repeatedly shown the land and water line to be perfectly level. 95. 
On a clear day from the high head near Douglas Harbour on the Isle of Man, the whole length of the coast of North Wales is often plainly visible to the naked eye. From the point of ear at the mouth of the River Dee to Holyhead comprises a fifty-mile stretch which has also been repeatedly found to be perfectly horizontal. If the Earth actually had curvature of eight inches per mile squared, as NASA and modern astronomy claim, the fifty-mile length of Welsh coast seen along the horizon in Liverpool Bay would have to decline from the center point an easily detectable 416 feet on each side. 96. From 100 Proofs the Earth is Not a Globe by William Carpenter If we take a journey down Chesapeake Bay by night, we shall see the light exhibited at Sharps Island for an hour before the steamer gets to it. We may take up a position on deck so that the rail of the vessel's side will be in a line with the light and in the line of sight, and we shall find that in the whole journey the light won't vary in the slightest degree in its apparent elevation. But say that a distance of 13 miles has been traversed, the astronomer's theory of curvature demands a difference, one way or the other, in the apparent elevation of the light of 112 feet 8 inches. Since, however, there is not a difference of 100 hairs' breadths, we have a plain proof that the water of the Chesapeake Bay is not curved, which is a proof that the Earth is not a globe. 97. NASA and modern astronomy say the Earth is a giant ball tilted back, wobbling and spinning 1,000 miles per hour around its central axis, traveling 67,000 miles per hour circles around the Sun, spiraling 500,000 miles per hour around the Milky Way, while the entire galaxy rockets a ridiculous 670 million miles through the universe, with all of these motions originating from an alleged Big Bang cosmogenic explosion 14 billion years ago. That's a grand total of 67,568,000 miles per hour in several different directions we're all supposedly speeding along at simultaneously, yet no one has ever seen, felt, heard, measured, or proven a single one of these motions to exist whatsoever. 98. NASA and modern astronomy say Polaris, the North Pole Star, is somewhere between 323 and 434 light years, or about two quadrillion miles, away from us. Firstly, note that is between 1 quadrillion 938 trillion to 2 quadrillion 604 trillion miles, making a difference of over 600 trillion miles. If modern astronomy cannot even agree on the distance to stars within hundreds of trillions of miles, perhaps their science is flawed and their theory needs re-examining. However, even granting them their obscurely distant stars, it is impossible for heliocentrists to explain how Polaris manages to always remain perfectly aligned straight above the North Pole throughout Earth's various alleged tilting, wobbling, rotating, and revolving motions. 99. Viewed from a ball Earth, Polaris, situated directly over the North Pole, should not be visible anywhere in the Southern Hemisphere. For Polaris to be seen from the Southern Hemisphere of a globular Earth, the observer would have to be somehow looking through the globe, and miles of land and sea would have to be transparent. Polaris can be seen, however, up to over 20 degrees south latitude. 100. If Earth were a ball, the Southern Cross and other Southern constellations would all be visible at the same time from every longitude on the same latitude, as is the case in the North with Polaris and its surrounding constellations. Ursa Major and Minor and many others can be seen from every Northern Meridian simultaneously, whereas in the South, constellations like the Southern Cross cannot. This proves that the Southern Hemisphere is not turned under, as in the ball model, but simply stretching further outwards away from the Northern Center Point, as in the Flat Earth model. 101. Sigma Octantis is claimed to be a southern central pole star similar to Polaris, around which the southern hemisphere stars all rotate around the opposite direction. Unlike Polaris, however, Sigma Octantis cannot be seen simultaneously from every point along the same latitude. It is not central, but allegedly one degree off-center. It is not motionless, and in fact cannot be seen at all using publicly available telescopes. There is legitimate speculation regarding whether Sigma Octantis even exists. Either way, the direction in which stars move overhead is based on perspective and the exact direction you're facing, not which hemisphere you're in. 102. Some heliocentrists have tried to suggest that the pole star's gradual declination overhead as an observer travels southward is proof of a globular Earth. 
Far from it, the declination of the pole star or any other object is simply a result of the law of perspective on plane, flat surfaces. The law of perspective dictates that the angle and height at which an object is seen diminishes the farther one recedes from the object, until at a certain point the line of sight and the seemingly uprising surface of the earth converges to a vanishing point, i.e. the horizon line, beyond which the object is invisible. In the ball earth model, the horizon is claimed to be the curvature of the earth, whereas in reality the horizon is known to simply be the vanishing line of perspective based on the strength of your eyes, instruments, weather, and altitude. 103. There are several constellations which can be seen from far greater distances over the face of the earth than should be possible if the world were a rotating, revolving, wobbling ball. For instance, Ursa Major, very close to Polaris, can be seen from 90 degrees north latitude, the North Pole, all the way down to 30 degrees south latitude. For this to be possible on a ball Earth, the southern observers would have to be seeing through hundreds or thousands of miles of bulging Earth to the northern sky. 104. The constellation Vulpecula can be seen from 90 degrees north latitude all the way to 55 degrees south latitude. Taurus, Pisces, and Leo can be seen from 90 degrees north all the way to 65 degrees south. An observer on a ball Earth, regardless of any tilt or inclination, should not logically be able to see this far. 105. Aquarius and Libra can be seen from 65 degrees north to 90 degrees south. The constellation Virgo is visible from 80 degrees north down to 80 degrees south. And Orion can be seen from 85 degrees north all the way to 75 degrees south latitude. These are all only possible because the hemispheres are not spheres at all, but concentric circles of latitude extending outwards from the central north pole, with the stars rotating over and around. 106. The so-called South Pole is simply an arbitrary point along the Antarctic ice marked with a red and white barbershop pole topped with a metal ball earth. The ceremonial South Pole is admittedly and provably not the actual South Pole, however, because the actual South Pole could be demonstrably confirmed with the aid of a compass showing north to be 360 degrees around the observer. Since this feat has never been achieved, the model remains pure theory, along with the establishment's excuse that the geomagnetic poles supposedly constantly move around making verifications of their claims impossible. 107. Ring magnets, of the kind found in loudspeakers, have a central north pole with the opposite south pole actually being all points along the outer circumference. This perfectly demonstrates the magnetism of our flat earth, whereas the alleged source of magnetism in the ball earth model is emitted from a hypothetical molten magnetic core in the center of the ball, which they claim conveniently causes both poles to constantly move, thus evading independent verification at their two ceremonial poles. In reality, the deepest drilling operation in history, the Russian Kola Ultra Deep, managed to get only eight miles down. So the entire ball earth model taught in schools showing a crust, outer mantle, inner mantle, outer core, and inner core layers are all purely speculation as we have never penetrated through beyond the crust. 108. The mariner's compass is an impossible and nonsensical instrument for use on a ball earth. It simultaneously points north and south over a flat surface, yet claims to be pinpointing two constantly moving geomagnetic poles at opposite ends of a spinning sphere, originating from a hypothetical molten metal core. If compass needles were actually drawn to the north pole of a globe, the opposing south needle would actually be pointing up and off into outer space. 109. There are no fixed east or west points, just as there is no fixed south. The North Central Pole is the only proven fixed point on our flat Earth, with the South being all straight lines outwards from the pole, East and West being concentric circles at constant right angles 90 degrees from the pole. A westerly circumnavigation of Earth is thus going around with Polaris continually on your right, while an easterly circumnavigation is going around with Polaris always at your left. 110. Magellan and others' east-west circumnavigations of Earth are often quoted as proof of the ball model. In actual fact, however, sailing or flying at right angles to the North Pole and eventually returning to one's original location is no more difficult or mysterious than doing so on a globe. Just as an architect's compass can place its center point on a flat piece of paper and trace a circle either way around the pole, so can a ship or plane circumnavigate a flat Earth. 111. 
Since the North Pole and Antarctica are covered in ice and guarded no-fly zones, no ships or planes have ever been known to circumnavigate the Earth in north-south directions. The only kind of circumnavigation which could not happen on a flat Earth is north and southbound, which is likely the very reason for the heavily enforced flight restrictions. The fact that there is yet to be a single verified north-to-south circumnavigation of Earth serves as standing proof the world is not a ball. 112. The sun brings noon to every time zone as it passes directly overhead every 15 degree demarcation point, 24 times per day, in its circular path over and around the Earth. If time zones were instead caused by the uniform spinning of the ball Earth around the sun, every six months as Earth found itself on the opposite side of the sun, clocks all over Earth would have to flip 12 hours. Day would be night, and night would be day. 113. The idea that people are standing, ships are sailing, and planes are flying upside down on certain parts of Earth, while others tilted at 90 degrees and all other impossible angles, is complete absurdity. The idea that a man digging a hole straight down could eventually reach sky on the other side is ludicrous. Common sense tells every free-thinking person correctly that there truly is an up and down in nature, unlike the everything-is-relative rhetoric of the Newtonian-Einsteinian paradigm. 114. Quoting On the False Wisdom of the Philosophers by Lacantius, A sphere where people on the other side live with their feet above their heads, where rain, snow, and hail fall upwards, where trees and crops grow upside down and the sky is lower than the ground, the ancient wonder of the hanging gardens of Babylon dwindle into nothing in comparison to the fields, seas, towns, and mountains that pagan philosophers believe to be hanging from the earth without support. 115. The existing laws of density and buoyancy perfectly explain the physics of falling objects long before knighted Freemason Sir Isaac Newton bestowed his theory of gravity upon the world. It is a fact that objects placed in denser mediums rise up, while objects placed in less dense mediums sink down. To fit with the heliocentric model, which has no up or down, Newton instead claimed objects are attracted to large masses and fall towards the center. Not a single experiment in history, however, has shown an object massive enough to, by virtue of its mass alone, cause other smaller masses to be attracted to it, as Newton claims gravity does with the Earth, the Sun, Moon, stars, and planets. 116. There has also never been a single experiment in history showing an object massive enough to, by virtue of its mass alone, cause another smaller mass to orbit around it. The magic theory of gravity allows for oceans, buildings, and people to remain forever stuck to the underside of a spinning ball, while simultaneously causing objects like the moon and satellites to remain locked in perpetual circular orbits around the Earth. If these were both true, then people should be able to jump up and start orbiting circles around the Earth, or the moon should have long ago been sucked into the Earth. Neither of these theories have ever been experimentally verified, and their alleged results are mutually exclusive. 117. Newton also theorized, and it is now commonly taught, that the Earth's ocean tides are caused by gravitational lunar attraction. If the moon is only 2,160 miles in diameter, and the Earth 8,000 miles, however, using their own math and law, it follows that the Earth is 87 times more massive and therefore the larger object should attract the smaller to it, and not the other way around. If the Earth's greater gravity is what keeps the moon in orbit, it is impossible for the moon's lesser gravity to supersede the Earth's gravity, especially at Earth's sea level, where its gravitational attraction would even further out-trump the moon's. And if the moon's gravity truly did supersede the Earth's, causing the tides to be drawn towards it, there should be nothing to stop them from continuing onwards and upwards towards their great attractor. 118. Furthermore, the velocity and path of the moon are uniform, and should therefore exist a uniform influence on the Earth's tide, when, in actuality, Earth's tides vary greatly and do not follow the moon. Earth's lakes, ponds, marshes, and other inland bodies of water also inexplicably remain forever outside the moon's gravitational grasp. If gravity was truly drawing Earth's oceans up to it, all lakes, ponds, and other bodies of standing water should certainly have tides as well. 119. It is claimed that the other planets are spheres, and so therefore Earth must also be a sphere. Firstly, Earth is a plane, not a planet, so the shape of these planets in the sky have no bearing on the shape of the Earth beneath our feet. 
Secondly, these planets have been known for thousands of years around the world as wandering stars, since they differ from the other fixed stars in their relative motions only. When looked at with an unprejudiced naked eye or through a telescope, the fixed and wandering stars appear as luminous disks of light, not spherical terra firma. The pictures and videos shown by NASA of spherical terra firma planets are all clearly fake computer-generated images and not photographs. 120. The etymology of the word planet actually comes from the late Old English planet, or from Old French planet, from Latin planeta, from Greek planetes, planetae, wandering stars, or to wander of unknown origin, uh, to spread, or notion of spread out, from Latin planum, flat surface, plane, level, plane. They just added a T to our earth plane, and everyone bought it. 121. When you observe the sun and moon, you see two equally sized equidistant circles tracing similar paths at similar speeds around a flat stationary earth. The experts at NASA, however, claim your common sense everyday experience is false on all counts. To begin with, they say the Earth is not flat, but a big ball. Not stationary, but spinning around 19 miles per second. They say the Sun does not revolve around the Earth as it appears, but Earth revolves around the Sun. The Moon, on the other hand, does revolve around the Earth, though not east to west as it appears, rather west to east. And the Sun is actually 400 times larger than the Moon and 400 times farther away. You can clearly see they are the same size and distance. You can see the Earth is flat, you can feel the Earth is stationary, but according to the gospel of modern astronomy, you are wrong and a simpleton worthy of endless ridicule if you dare to trust your own eyes and experience. 122. Quoting Alan Daves. If the government or NASA had said to you that the Earth is stationary, imagine that. And then imagine we are trying to convince people that no, no, it's not stationary. It's moving forward at 32 times rifle bullet speed and spinning at a thousand miles per hour. We would be laughed at. We would have so many people telling us, you're crazy, the Earth's not moving. We would be ridiculed for having no scientific backing for this convoluted moving Earth theory. And not only that, but then people would say, oh, then how do you explain a fixed calm atmosphere and the sun's observable movement? How do you explain that? Imagine saying to people, no, no, the atmosphere is moving also, but is somehow magically velcroed to the moving Earth. The reason is not simply because the Earth is stationary. So what we are actually doing is what makes sense. We are saying that the moving Earth theory is nonsense. The stationary Earth theory makes sense, and we are being ridiculed. You've got to picture it being the other way around to realize just how ridiculous the situation is. This theory from the government and NASA that the Earth is rotating and orbiting and leaning over and wobbling is absolute nonsense, and yet people are clinging to it tightly like a teddy bear. They just can't bring themselves to face the possibility that the Earth is stationary, though all evidence shows it. We feel no movement, the atmosphere hasn't been blown away, we see the sun move from east to west, everything can be explained by a motionless Earth without bringing in all these assumptions to cover up previous assumptions gone bad. 123. Heliocentrists' astronomical figures always sound perfectly precise, but they have historically been notorious for regularly and drastically changing them to suit their various models. For instance, in his time, Copernicus calculated the sun's distance from Earth to be 3,391,200 miles. The next century, Johannes Kepler decided it was actually 12,376,800 miles away. Isaac Newton once said, It matters not whether we reckon it 28 or 54 million miles distant, for either would do just as well. How scientific! Benjamin Martin calculated between 81 and 82 million miles. Thomas Dilworth claimed 93,726,900 miles. John Hine stated positively 95,298,260 miles. Benjamin Gould said more than 96 million miles and Christian Mayer thought it was more than 104 million. Flat earthers throughout the ages, conversely, have used sextants and plane trigonometry to make such calculations, and found the sun and the moon both to be only about 32 miles in diameter and less than a few thousand miles from Earth. 124. Amateur balloon footage taken above the clouds has provided stunning visual proof that the sun cannot be millions of miles away. In several shots, you can see a clear hot spot reflecting on the clouds directly below the sun's spotlight-like influence. If the sun were actually millions of miles away, such a small localized hot spot could not occur. 125. 
Another proof the sun is not millions of miles away is found by tracing the angle of sun rays back to their source above the clouds. There are thousands of pictures showing how sunlight comes down through cloud cover at a variance of converging angles. The area of convergence is, of course, the sun, and is not millions of miles away, but rather relatively close to Earth, just above the clouds. 126. The sun's annual journey from tropic to tropic, solstice to solstice, is what determines the length and character of days, nights, and seasons. This is why equatorial regions experience almost year-round summer and heat, while higher latitudes north, and especially south, experience more distinct seasons with harsh winters. The heliocentric model claims seasons change based on the ball Earth's alleged axial tilt and elliptical orbit around the sun, yet their flawed current model places us closest to the sun, 91 million miles, in January, when it is actually winter, and farthest from the sun, 94.5 million miles, in July, when it's actually summer throughout most of the Earth. 127. The fact that the sun and moon's reflections on water always form a straight line path from the horizon to the observer proves the earth is not a ball. If the earth's surface was curved, it would be impossible for the reflected light to curve over the ball from horizon to observer. 128. There are huge centuries-old stone sundials and moon dials all over the world which still tell the time now down to the minute as perfectly as the day they were made. If the Earth, Sun, and Moon were truly subject to the number of contradictory, revolving, rotating, wobbling, and spiraling motions claimed by modern astronomy, it would be impossible for these monuments to so accurately tell time without constant adjustment. 129. To quote William Carpenter, Why in the name of common sense should observers have to fix their telescopes on solid stone bases so that they should not move a hair's breadth? if the earth on which they fix them moves at the rate of 19 miles in a second. Indeed, to believe that 6,000 million 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 tons is rolling, surging, flying, darting on through space forever with a velocity compared with which a shot from a cannon is a very slow coach, with such unerring accuracy that a telescope fixed on granite pillars in an observatory will not enable a lynx-eyed astronomer to detect a variation in its onward motion of the thousandth part of a hair's breadth is to conceive a miracle compared with which all the miracles on record put together would sink into utter insignificance. Since we can, in middle north latitudes, see the North Star on looking out of a window that faces it, and out of this very same corner of the very same pane of glass in the very same window all the year round, it is proof enough for any man in his senses that we have not made any motion at all and that the Earth is not a globe. 130. From Earth Not a Globe by Samuel Robotham. Take two carefully bored metallic tubes, not less than six feet in length, and place them one yard asunder on the opposite sides of a wooden frame, or a solid block of wood or stone, so adjust them that their centers or axes of vision shall be perfectly parallel to each other. Now direct them to the plane of some notable fixed star a few seconds previous to its meridian time. Let an observer be stationed at each tube, and the moment the star appears in the first tube, let a loud knock or other signal be given to be repeated by the observer at the second tube when he sees the same star. A distinct period of time will elapse between the signals given. The signals will follow each other in very rapid succession, but still, the time between is sufficient to show that the same star is not visible at the same moment by two parallel lines of sight when only one yard asunder. A slight inclination of the second tube towards the first tube would be required for the star to be seen through both tubes at the same instant. Let the tubes remain in their positions for six months, at the end of which time the same observation or experiment will produce the same results. The star will be visible at the same meridian time without the slightest alteration being required in the direction of the tubes, from which it is concluded that if the Earth had moved one single yard in an orbit through space, there would at least be observed the slight inclination of the tube which the difference in position of one yard had previously required. But as no such difference in the direction of the tube is required, the conclusion is unavoidable, that in six months a given meridian upon the Earth's surface does not move a single yard, and therefore that the Earth has not the slightest degree of orbital motion. 131. NASA and modern astronomy maintain that the moon is a solid, spherical, Earth-like habitation which man has actually flown to and set foot on. They claim the moon is a non-luminescent planetoid which receives and reflects all its light from the sun. 
The reality is, however, that the moon is observably not a solid body. It is clearly circular, but not spherical, and not in any way an Earth-like planetoid which humans could set foot on. In fact, the moon has been proven largely transparent and completely self-luminescent, shining with its own unique light. 132. The sun's light is golden, warm, drying, preservative, and antiseptic, while the moon's light is silver, cool, damp, putrefying, and septic. The sun's rays decrease the combustion of a bonfire, while the moon's rays increase combustion. Plant and animal substances exposed to sunlight quickly dry, shrink, coagulate, and lose the tendency to decompose and putrefy. Grapes and other fruits become solid, partially candied and preserved, like raisins, dates, and prunes. Animal flesh coagulates, loses its volatile, gaseous constituents, becomes firm, dry, and slow to decay. When exposed to moonlight, however, plant and animal substances tend to show symptoms of putrefaction and decay. This proves that sun and moonlight are different, unique, and opposites, as they are in the geocentric flat model. 133. In direct sunlight, a thermometer will read higher than another thermometer placed in the shade. But in full direct moonlight, a thermometer will read lower than another placed in the shade. If the sun's light is collected in a large lens and thrown to a focus point, it can create significant heat, while the moon's light collected similarly creates no heat. In the Lancet Medical Journal from March 14, 1856, particulars are given of several experiments which prove the moon's rays, when concentrated, can actually reduce the temperature upon a thermometer more than 8 degrees. So sunlight and moonlight clearly have altogether different properties. 134. Furthermore, the moon itself cannot physically be both a spherical body and a reflector of the sun's light. Reflectors must be flat or concave for light rays to have any angle of incidence. If a reflector's surface is convex, then every ray of light points in a direct line with the radius perpendicular to the surface, resulting in no reflection. 135. Not only is the moon clearly self-luminescent, shining its own unique light, but it is also largely transparent. When the waxing or waning moon is visible during the day, it is possible to see the blue sky right through the moon. And on a clear night, during a waxing or waning cycle, it is even possible to occasionally see stars and planets directly through the surface of the moon. The Royal Astronomical Society has on record many such occurrences throughout history which all defy the heliocentric model. 136. Many people think that modern astronomy's ability to accurately predict lunar and solar eclipses is a result and proof positive of the heliocentric theory of the universe. The fact of the matter, however, is that eclipses have been accurately predicted by cultures worldwide for thousands of years before the heliocentric ball earth was even a glimmer in Copernicus's imagination. Ptolemy, in the first century AD, accurately predicted eclipses for 600 years on the basis of a flat stationary earth with equal position as anyone living today. All the way back in 600 BC, Thales accurately predicted an eclipse which ended the war between the Medes and the Lydians. Eclipses happen regularly with precision in 18-year cycles, so regardless of geocentric or heliocentric flat or globe-earth cosmologies, eclipses can be accurately calculated independent of such factors. 137. Another assumption and supposed proof of the Earth's shape, heliocentrists claim that lunar eclipses are caused by the shadow of the ball Earth occulting the moon. They claim the sun, earth, and moon spheres perfectly align like three billiard balls in a row so that the sun's light casts the earth's shadow onto the moon. Unfortunately for heliocentrists, this explanation is rendered completely invalid due to the fact that lunar eclipses have happened and continue to happen regularly when both the sun and moon are still visible together above the horizon. For the sun's light to be casting earth's shadow onto the moon, the three bodies must be aligned in a straight 180 degree syzygy, but as early as the time of Pliny, there are records of lunar eclipses happening while both the sun and moon are visible in the sky. Therefore, the eclipser of the moon cannot be the earth or earth's shadow, and some other explanation must be sought. 138. Another favorite proof of ball earthers is the appearance from an observer on shore of ships' hulls being obfuscated by the water and disappearing from view when sailing away towards the horizon. Their claim is that ships' hulls disappear before their mastheads because the ship is beginning its declination around the convex curvature of the ball earth. Once again, however, their hasty conclusion is drawn from a faulty premise, namely that only on a ball earth could this phenomenon occur. The fact of the matter is that the law of perspective on plane surfaces dictates and necessitates the exact same occurrence. 
For example, a girl wearing a dress walking away towards the horizon will appear to sink into the earth the farther away she walks. Her feet will disappear from view first, and the distance between the ground and the bottom of her dress will gradually diminish until, after a half a mile, it seems like her dress is touching the ground as she walks on invisible legs. Such is the case on plain surfaces. The lowest parts of objects receding from a given point of observation necessarily disappear before the highest. 139. Not only is the disappearance of ship's hulls explained by the law of perspective on flat surfaces, it is proven undeniably true with the aid of a good telescope. If you watch a ship sailing away into the horizon with the naked eye until its hull has completely disappeared from view under the supposed curvature of the earth, then look through a telescope, you will notice the entire ship quickly zooms back into view, hull and all, proving that the disappearance was caused by the law of perspective, not by a wall of curved water. This also proves that the horizon is simply the vanishing line of perspective from your point of view, not the alleged curvature of the earth. 140. Foucault's pendulums are often quoted as proof of a rotating Earth, but upon closer investigation prove the opposite. To begin with, Foucault's pendulums do not uniformly swing in any one direction. Sometimes they rotate clockwise and sometimes counterclockwise. Sometimes they fail to rotate and sometimes they rotate far too much. The behavior of the pendulum actually depends on 1. the initial force beginning its swing, and 2. the ball and socket joint, which most readily facilitates circular motion over any other. The supposed rotation of the Earth is completely inconsequential and irrelevant to the pendulum's swing. If the alleged constant rotation of the Earth affected pendulums in any way, then there should be no need to manually start pendulums in motion. If the Earth's diurnal rotation caused the 360-degree uniform diurnal rotation of pendulums, then there should not exist a stationary pendulum anywhere on Earth. 141. The Coriolis effect is often said to cause sinks and toilet bowls in the northern hemisphere to drain spinning in one direction, while in the southern hemisphere causing them to spin the opposite way, thus providing proof of the spinning ball earth. Once again, however, just like Foucault's pendulums spinning either which way, sinks and toilets in the northern and southern hemispheres do not consistently spin in any one direction. Sinks and toilets in the very same household are often found to spin opposite directions, depending entirely upon the shape of the basin and the angle of the water's entry, not the supposed rotation of the earth. 142. People claim that if the earth were flat, they should be able to use a telescope and see clear across the oceans. This is absurd, however, as the air is full of precipitation, especially over the oceans, and especially at the lowest, densest layer of atmosphere, is not transparent. Picture the blurry haze over roads on hot, humid days. Even the best telescope will blur out long before you could see across an ocean. You can, however, use a telescope to zoom in much more of our flat Earth than would be possible on a ball 25,000 miles in circumference. 143. People claim that if the Earth were flat, with the sun circling over and around us, we should be able to see the sun from everywhere, all over the Earth, and there should be daylight, even at night time. Since the sun is not 93 million miles away, but rather just a few thousand, and shining down like a spotlight, once it has moved significantly far enough away from your location, it becomes invisible beyond the horizon, and daylight slowly fades until it completely disappears. If the sun were 93 million miles away and the earth a spinning ball, the transition from daylight to night would instead be almost instantaneous as you pass the Terminator line. 144. Pictures of the moon appearing upside down in the southern hemisphere and right side up in the north are often cited as proof of the ball earth, but once again, upon closer inspection, provide another proof of the flat model. In fact, time-lapse photography shows the moon itself turns clockwise like a wheel as it circles over and around the earth. You can find pictures of the moon at 360 degrees of various inclination from all over the earth, simply depending on where and when the picture was taken. 145. Heliocentrists believe the moon is a ball, even though its appearance is clearly that of a flat luminous disk. We only ever see the same one face, albeit at various inclinations, of the moon, yet it is claimed that there is another dark side of the moon which remains hidden. NASA states the moon spins opposite the spin of the Earth in such a perfectly synchronized way that the motions cancel each other out, so we will conveniently never be able to observe the supposed dark side of the moon outside of their terrible fake CGI images. The fact of the matter is, however, if the moon were a sphere, observers in Antarctica would see a different face from those at the equator, yet they do not. Just the same flat face rotated at various degrees. 146. 
The Ball Earth model claims the moon orbits around the Earth once every 28 days, yet it is plain for anyone to see that the moon orbits around the Earth every single day. The moon's orbit is slightly slower than the sun's, but follows the sun's same path from tropic to tropic, solstice to solstice, making a full circle over the Earth in just under 25 hours. 147. The Ball Earth model claims the sun is precisely 400 times larger than the moon and 400 times further away from Earth, making them falsely appear exactly the same size. Once again, the Ball model asks us to accept as coincidence something that cannot be explained other than by natural design. The sun and moon occupy the same amount of space in the sky and have been measured with sextants to be of equal size and equal distance, so claiming otherwise is against our eyes, experience, experiments, and common sense. 148. Quoting Earth Not a Globe by Samuel Robotham, It is found by observation that the stars come to the meridian about four minutes earlier every 24 hours than the sun, taking the solar time as the standard. This makes 120 minutes every 30 days and 24 hours in the year, hence all the constellations have passed before or in advance of the sun at that time. This is the simple fact as observed in nature, but the theory of rotundity and motion on axes and in an orbit has no place for it. Visible truth must be ignored because this theory stands in the way and prevents its votaries from understanding it. 149. Throughout thousands of years, the same constellations have remained fixed in their same patterns without moving out of position whatsoever. If the Earth were a big ball spinning around a bigger sun, spinning around a bigger galaxy, shooting off from the biggest bang as NASA claims, it is impossible that the constellations would remain so fixed. Based on their model, we should, in fact, have an entirely different night sky every single night and never repeat exactly the same star pattern twice. 150. If Earth were a spinning ball, it would be impossible to photograph star trail time lapses turning perfect circles around Polaris anywhere but the North Pole. At all other vantage points, the stars would be seen to travel more or less horizontally across the observer's horizon due to the alleged thousand mile per hour motion beneath their feet. In reality, however, Polaris's surrounding stars can always be photographed turning perfect circles around the central star all the way down to the Tropic of Capricorn. 151. If Earth were a spinning ball revolving around the Sun, it would actually be impossible for star trail photos to show perfect circles even at the North Pole. Since the Earth is also allegedly moving 67,000 miles per hour around the Sun, the Sun moving 500,000 miles per hour around the Milky Way, and the entire galaxy going 67 million miles per hour, these four contradictory motions would make star trail time lapses all show irregular curved lines. 152. In 2003, Three university geography professors collaborated in an experiment to prove that the state of Kansas is indeed actually flatter than a pancake. Using topographical geodetic surveys covering over 80,000 square miles, it was determined that Kansas has a flatness ratio of 0.9997 over the entire state, while the average pancake, precisely measured using a confocal laser microscope, comes in at 0.957, making Kansas thereby literally flatter than a pancake. 153. Quoting Reverend Thomas Milner's Atlas of Physical Geography, we find that vast areas exhibit a perfectly dead level, scarcely arise existing through 1,500 miles from the Carpathians to the Urals. South of the Baltic, the country is so flat that a prevailing north wind will drive the waters of the Statner Half into the mouth of the Oder and give the river a backwards flow 30 or 40 miles. The plains of Venezuela and New Granada in South America, chiefly on the left of the Orinoco, are termed Ilanos, or level fields. Often, in the space of 270 square miles, the surface does not vary a single foot. The Amazon only falls 12 feet in the last 700 miles of its course. The La Plata has only a descent of 1 33rd of an inch per mile. 154. The Felix Baumgartner Red Bull dive outside camera shows the same amount of curvature of Earth from surface level to jump height, proving it to be a deceiving fish-eyed wide-angle lens, while the inside regular camera shows a perfectly flat horizon eye level at 128,000 feet, which is only consistent with a flat plane. 155. Some people claim to have seen the curvature of the Earth out their airplane windows. The glass used in all commercial airplanes, however, is curved to remain flush with the fuselage. This creates a slight effect mixed with the confirmation bias people mistake for being the alleged curvature of the Earth, 
In actuality, the fact that you see the horizon at eye level at 35,000 feet out both port and starboard windows proves the Earth is flat. If the Earth were a ball, no matter how big, the horizon would stay exactly where it was, and you would have to look down further and further to see the horizon at all. Looking straight out the window at 35,000 feet, you should see nothing but outer space from the port and starboard windows, as the Earth and horizon are supposed to be below you. If they are visible at eye level outside both windows, it's because the Earth is flat. 156. People also claim to see curvature in GoPro or other high-altitude camera footage of the horizon. While it is true that the horizon often appears convex in such footage, it just as often appears concave or flat depending on the tilt and movement of the camera. The effect is simply a distortion due to wide-angle lenses. In lens corrected and footage taken without wide-angle technology, all amateur high-altitude horizon shots appear perfectly flat. 157. If gravity magically dragged the atmosphere along with the spinning ball Earth, that would mean the atmosphere near the equator would be spinning at over a thousand miles per hour, the atmosphere over the mid-latitudes would be spinning around 500 miles per hour, and gradually slower to the poles where the atmosphere would be unaffected at zero miles per hour. In reality, however, the atmosphere at every point on Earth is equally unaffected by this alleged force, as it has never been measured or calculated and proven non-existent by the ability of airplanes to fly unabated in any direction without experiencing any such atmospheric changes. 158. If gravity magically dragged the atmosphere along with the spinning ball Earth, that would mean the higher the altitude, the faster the spinning atmosphere would have to be turning around the center of rotation. In reality, however, if this were happening, then rain and fireworks would behave entirely differently as they fell down through progressively slower and slower spinning atmosphere. Hot air balloons would also be forced steadily faster eastwards as they ascended through the ever-increasing atmospheric speeds. 159. If there were progressively faster and faster spinning atmosphere the higher the altitude, that would mean it would have to abruptly end at some key altitude where the fastest layer of gravitized spinning atmosphere meets the supposed non-gravitized, non-spinning, non-atmosphere of infinite vacuum space. NASA has never even mentioned what altitude this impossible feat allegedly happens, but it is easily philosophically refuted by the simple fact that vacuums cannot exist connected to non-vacuums while maintaining the properties of a vacuum. Not to mention, the effect such a transition would have on a rocket spaceship would be disastrous. 160. It is impossible for rockets or any type of jet propulsion engines to work in the alleged non-atmosphere of vacuum space because without air or atmosphere to push against, there is nothing to propel the vehicle forwards. Instead, the rockets and shuttles would be sent spinning around their own axis uncontrollably in all directions like a gyroscope. It would be impossible to fly to the moon or go in any direction whatsoever, especially if gravity were real and constantly sucking you towards the closest, densest body. 161. If Earth were really a ball, there would be no reason to use rockets for flying into outer space anyway, because simply flying an airplane straight at any altitude for long enough should and would send you off into outer space. To prevent their airplanes from flying tangent to the ball Earth, pilots would have to constantly course correct downwards, or else within just a few hours, the average commercial airliner traveling 500 miles per hour would find themselves lost in outer space. The fact that this never happens, artificial horizons remain level at pilots' desired altitudes and do not require constant downward adjustments, proves the Earth is not a ball. 162. All NASA and other space agencies' rocket launches never go straight up. Every rocket forms a parabolic curve, peaks out, and inevitably starts falling back to Earth. The rockets which are declared successful are those few which don't explode or start falling too soon, but make it out of range of spectator view before crashing down into restricted waters and recovered. There is no magic altitude where rockets or anything else can simply go up, 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 and then suddenly just start free-floating in space. This is all a science fiction illusion created by wires, green screens, dark pools, some permed hair, and zero-g planes. 163. NASA and other space agencies have been caught time and again with air bubbles forming and floating off in their official outer space footage. Astronauts have also been caught using scuba space gear, kicking their legs to move, and astronaut Luca Parmitano even almost drowned when water started filling up his helmet while allegedly on a spacewalk. 
It is admitted that astronauts train for their spacewalks in underwater training facilities like NASA's Neutral Buoyancy Lab, but what is obvious from their space bubbles and other blunders is that all official spacewalk footage is also fake and filmed underwater. 164. Analysis of many interior videos from the International Space Station have shown the use of camera tricks such as green screens, harnesses, and even wildly permed hair to achieve a zero-gravity type effect. Footage of the astronauts seemingly floating in the zero gravity of their space station is indistinguishable from Vomit Comet zero-g airplane footage. By flying parabolic maneuvers, this zero-g floating effect can be achieved over and over again, then edited together. For longer uncut shots, NASA has been caught using simple wires and green screen technology. 165. NASA claims one can observe the International Space Station pass by overhead proving its existence, yet analysis of the ISS seen through zoom cameras proves it to be some type of hologram or drone, not a physical floating space base. As you can see in my documentary ISS hoax, when zooming in and out, the ISS dramatically and impossibly changes shape and color, displaying a prismatic rainbow effect until coming into focus much like an old television turning on and off. 166. The geostationary communications satellite was first created by Freemason science fiction writer Arthur C. Clarke and supposedly became science fact just a decade later. Before this, radio, television, and navigation systems like Loran and DECA were already well established and worked fine using only ground-based technologies. Nowadays, huge fiber optic cables connect the internet across oceans, gigantic cell towers triangulate GPS signals, and ionospheric propagation allows radio waves to be bounced all without the aid of the science fiction bestseller known as satellites. 167. Satellites are allegedly floating around in the thermosphere, where temperatures are claimed to be upwards of 4,530 degrees Fahrenheit. The metals used in satellites, however, such as aluminum, gold, and titanium, have melting points of 1,221, 1,948, and 3,034 degrees respectively, all far lower than they could possibly handle.